Hey there, TCC. Welcome to our online service. My name is Ty, and this is Crystal, and we're so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday here with us at Tulare Community Church. Here at TCC, we strive to be disciples of Jesus and to make disciples of Jesus through our ministries and events. We want to embrace our name, Tulare Community Church, and be about loving and supporting our community, both within the church walls and outside of them. Yeah, we've throttled back a bit on our ministries that we offer during the summer, but get ready because when we return in the fall, we're hitting the ground running. Oh, that's right. We'll have on-campus weekly ministries for you to connect, serve, and invite your friends to be a part of with you. For all of those details and dates for those ministries and events, be sure that you're subscribed to and reading the TCC Weekly email each Thursday. And don't forget to follow us on social media. One upcoming event that we want to highlight is our 50th anniversary celebration coming this fall. I hope that even if you're exclusively an online attendee these days, that you will consider joining us for that event. We'll have more details about when and where that event will be as we get a little closer. Also, for those of you who have been a part of TCC for a while, we need your help. If you have good photos of any notable events throughout our TCC history, please share those with us. That's right. So some of the types of photos that we're searching for are things like the startup of TCC, major changes throughout the years, church plants, special events, drive-up services, building projects, 
you get the idea. If you think you may have any photos that fit what we were looking for, we would love for you to bring or send those to the TCC office as soon as possible. Yeah, I can't wait to see all the pictures from throughout the last 50 years, and I look forward to celebrating the work the Lord has been doing through this church together this fall. Okay, there is more to know about stuff going on at and through TCC right now, but for time's sake, we'll direct you to that weekly email we discussed earlier for all the latest. Yeah, if you don't receive that and you'd like to, just contact our office and we'll get you added to the list. Okay, last thing before we throw it back to the stage, if this is your first time tuning into TCC Online today, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We are so glad that you're here, and we hope that you feel connected and loved. If you would like to learn more about life and ministry at TCC, head to our website and fill out our Connect form, or get in touch with our office. We would love to have the chance to meet you. Well, we're going to turn it back over to the band on stage as we continue with our time of worship now. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Back to you, worship team.
Hear now the word of the Lord from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. It says this, The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your eyes, because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Friends, it's the word of the Lord. We say thanks be to God. Hey, the Lord be with you, Tulare Community Church. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at TCC. We are embarking on a new journey. Today is the kickoff of a new sermon series that we're calling Kingdom Parables. Last fall, we were working through our preaching schedule for the entire year, It's a process that takes several hours, and as we were looking through different passages, different books of the Bible, we noticed a theme in the book of Matthew. Over and over, we noticed these words. Jesus told them a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like dot, dot, dot. In fact, in the book of Matthew, Jesus uses a parable to describe the kingdom of heaven 32 times. What we also found was that some of these parables describing the kingdom of heaven were serious head scratchers. So, the summer, when everyone is gone, seemed as good a time as any to take a whack at them. As I've drawn the short straw today, we've got quite a doozy. The disciples are exhausted and just flat out ask Jesus, why do you speak to people in parables? We're going to break down Jesus' answer into three parts. One, a disguised truth, a sovereign kingdom, and an irresistible grace. A disguised truth, a sovereign kingdom, and an irresistible grace. Now, there's a concept in public speaking and in writing called show, don't tell. We tend to understand things when we hear them indirectly rather than straight on. Somebody can tell you about the physics and the release point and the angles of shooting a basketball, or somebody can actually help guide your shoulder, elbow, and wrist. Claire and I have been doing premarital counseling together. For the last couple weddings, I've had the honor of officiating in part because I could try to tell the folks how we expertly walk through disagreements in our own marriage, or they can see the truth and watch us fail in real time, real space, so that they know they're not alone when they do the very same thing. In part, this is what Jesus is up to when he teaches in parables. Later on in this chapter, Jesus teaches in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 47 to 50. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. And they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Pretty straightforward, right? As fishermen separate good fish and bad fish, so the angels will do with people. Jesus takes something that's a little intangible, a little philosophical, a little far away, and he makes it tangible, he makes it concrete, he makes it real, and he makes it right here. So in a way, Jesus is just a really good teacher, knowing that we learn better, understand more when we're shown, not told. Jesus' words in our passage also point us to something else we all know to be true. Sometimes hearts are too hardened to be able to take in the truth directly. A buddy of mine is a successful produce lobbyist in Visalia, and as a young man, he was on the wrong side of addiction, found himself sleeping in the street. He got involved in Teen Challenge, got sober, went back to school in his late 20s, got a bachelor's, got an MBA. Now on the right side of addiction, decades later, he speaks into the lives of young men whose shoes he used to wear. In the midst of all this, I've heard him say on multiple occasions, I can tell this guy all day what he needs to do, but he's not ready to hear it right now. Someday though, He will be. Again, verse 13, Jesus says, This is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. Perhaps Jesus speaks in parables knowing that the person hearing them is unprepared to hear the truth in the moment, but the words will linger and present themselves when the day comes. Show, don't tell. Plant a seed till the time is right. Potential reasons for sure, but there's also something more. Something perhaps more important something that I want to return to just a little bit later. 
Now, our second point, a sovereign kingdom. I, I invite you to take a deep breath because things are about to get a little hairy. Jesus says in verse 13, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Now, in them is referring to those who see but don't really see, those who hear but don't understand. Jesus then quotes from Isaiah 6 in verses 14 and 15. You will be ever hearing but not understanding. You will be ever seeing but not perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and in turn I would heal them. There are those who see the secrets of the kingdom of heaven when they're shown them and there are those who understand the secrets of heaven when they hear them. Maybe you can tell where we're going with all of this. If not, let me show you. Now, I've shared this story so many times, but it's just so ridiculously helpful. Martin Luther was a monk in Germany during the 15th and 16th centuries. Luther desperately wanted to know that his salvation was certain. That meant being absolved of all of his sins. Theologically, at the time, this meant the confession of sins during the sacrament of penance. So Luther spent a lot of time in that confessional booth. Eric Metaxas, his biography of Luther, details that he would spend four or five hours at a time confessing his sins, would then begin confessing his pride for not being able to think of any more sins to confess, and would then walk around terrified that he would get struck by lightning or that a tree would fall on him before he had a chance to confess his sins one last time. After living on the perpetual edge of a nervous meltdown for years, Luther thought, this is crazy. And he read passages like Romans 8, which says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. What he began to realize is that salvation does not rest on doing good things or living a good life, but on faith in Jesus. And faith in Jesus only comes by the leading of the Holy Spirit through grace. What does this emphasize? The kingdom of heaven, a past kingdom founded by Christ, a present kingdom being reclaimed by Christ, and a future kingdom conquered by Christ's return, that emphasizes that that kingdom belongs to God, is fulfilled by God, controlled by God, and is populated by those God wants inside of it. So as Jesus shares about the kingdom of heaven over which God is sovereign, he does so knowing that some will be given eyes to see and ears to understand, and some won't. In our passage, he demonstrates this by quoting from Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, God is fed up with Israel. Their collective heart is calloused. If it wasn't, the people would have turned back towards God and he would have healed them. But if we have a sober, honest, and transparent understanding of our relationship to sin, who can honestly claim to have a soft heart rather than a calloused one if left to their own devices? How different are we than Israel? See, Christianity states that God is good, that he's devoid of all things bad or evil. And Jesus is the ultimate good to have entered the world, the only good, full stop, in fact. If we believe in him, we are making a good decision, the ultimate good decision of not only an eternity spent with him, but a present spent with him as well. With an honest understanding of our own sin and an honest understanding of God's goodness, as Article 14 of the Belgic Confession states, who can boast of being able to do anything good by oneself since Christ says, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me? Who can glory in their own will when they understand that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God? The kingdom of God, as Jesus exemplifies in our passage, is open to those whom God decides to give eyes to see and ears to hear. Remember verses 11 and 12, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they do have will be taken from them. God reigns over the kingdom of heaven. He is sovereign over the kingdom of heaven. He decides what the kingdom of heaven is and who will be given eyes to see it and ears to hear it. Now for many, this reality is too much to bear. Any notion of our own, of our dependence being on something or someone out of our own control causes resistance, anger, and indignation. But paradoxically, the sovereignty of the kingdom of Christ leads us not into some kind of imprisonment, but to freedom. Jesus' explanation of his use of parables to describe the kingdom of heaven leads us to an irresistible grace. Imagine if for a moment you are alone. It's dark, but up in front of you is heaven. It's bright. And it's really not that far away. In fact, there's actually a way to get to it. 
there's a path right at your feet. And next to that path are instructions. And the instructions, while challenging, aren't impossible. You believe you can do them. But in order to do them right, you can't lose focus, can't lose resolve, you can't screw up. If you do screw up, you must go backward, away from heaven. And sometimes you're able to follow the directions really well and you move forward two, three, four, even five steps closer to heaven, but then you get tired, you stumble, you take a break from the instructions because though possible, man, are they tough. And you're only human, right? And so sometimes you say, forget it, and you quit because you're too tired to be perfect. Years go by, and over the course of a lifetime, you've moved forward, you've moved backward, and maybe on your last day, you're closer to heaven than when you started, but you still haven't arrived, and pencils down, time has run out. Now, where is God in this scenario if you believe that God exists? For some, he's not there at all. It's just you, all alone. For others, God's around, but he's busy doing his own thing, not paying any attention to you and your journey. And for some, God's there, but he's on a throne, far away, watching, arms crossed, waiting for you to screw up so he can say, wrong, all wrong. And for others still, God is actually walking the path with you, saying, you got it. It's not how many times you fall down. Believe in yourself. Unlock your Enneagram number. But what does Jesus tell us in our passage? But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. See, grace doesn't work like any of those scenarios at all. Grace is God seeing you on this path, picking you up like we pick up a child and carrying you the whole way. And when you try to say, okay, God, I get it now, I'll take it from here. Instead of God saying, fine. You know what? Knock yourself out, but don't say I didn't tell you so. He says, shh, it's okay. You're safe. I got you. I'll carry you. In fact, I'll do everything for you, and I'll ask nothing in return. This is exactly what Jesus does for us on the cross. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And no matter how hard we scream and fight and kick and bite, trying to do it on our own, resisting him the whole way, he refuses to let go. It's irresistible. He is irresistible. For those whom God has chosen to carry, we have no choice in the matter. He will save us because that's what he wants, though it's not what we deserve. His grace is good. His grace is irresistible. And as we close, remember the story. Do you remember the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19 after he's killed all the prophets of Baal? You know the story. He tells them to light a fire with their gods. They can't do it. So he asks the Lord God to light a fire. God does. And Elijah proceeds to slaughter all the prophets. Can't wait to read that as a bedtime story to my soon-to-be child. Well, after this, Elijah is exhausted. And God doesn't approach Elijah and say, hey, tough up. We've got more work to do. An angel comes and approaches Elijah gently, again, like a parent to a child. And perhaps this is precisely what Jesus is doing when he teaches us about the kingdom of heaven through parables. Perhaps he knows we can't handle the truth straight on. So like the angel whispering to Elijah gently, Jesus disguises the truth so that we can understand it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
See as you go forth this week, I pray that the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you both now and always. Amen.